Okay, last time we were talking about the need for revolution and sure. how violence will be inflicted on any revolution because capitalism is inherently violent. Mm -hmm. I think I got that right. Yeah. Um, but you are an able-bodied white guy mm -hmm. with a family, and you're also living in a foreign country now. Mm -hmm. When you say, yeah, well, there's going to be a revolution, there's got to be a revolution, and that's required to stop capitalism. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a privileged position for you? Um, it can be a privileged position for me, mm -hmm. while not being an inherently privileged position. Okay. Um, and the reason why I say that is that, sure, I might not suffer under that situation. I will. Um, not as bad as others, but this isn't this isn't a competition. Mm -hmm. um, there's no there's there's no oppression Olympics as it would be. Um, everyone will suffer under capitalism, and everyone will suffer under revolution. That's just a fact. Now, the reason why it's not a privileged position, though, is look at history, look at communism, look at socialism, look at Marxism in the past. The people who undertake these revolutions successfully are not privileged people. These are people who have a, a heel on their head, they're being held down, and they're they being oppressed, and they're being brutalized. And the revolution is not, a, is not really a bunch of educated people who are distanced from reality, who are saying, we, we're not going to take this anymore. It's the people who are being affected, saying, we're not going to take this anymore. Um, that's that's leftist history now you do of course have academics and what have you in leftist movements and they have their place they have their value but a a workers revolution a leftist revolution requires people who are already subject to violence to be standing up um ultimately if anything for someone like me or somebody like uh, an academic to say, we need to have this revolution, I want to be a part of this revolution, what they are doing is they are sort of sharing the target. Um, they are spreading around that potential violence. You, you're 25-year-old you're at Berkeley who has never worked a day in his life and who is living off of his parents. Mm -hmm. If that person if that person went the rest of his life without a revolution, that he's probably fine. He's probably going to live a relatively comfortable life. He's going to Berkeley. He's got a good job ahead of him, whatever. If he gets involved in this, in this theoretical revolution, he could die. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to say that people don't understand those consequences, but I think that that's infantilizing. Okay. I think that a lot of people realize that if, if revolution comes, that if we demand that things change and that we demand the things that we require in order to live safe, fulfilling lives, that they will get hurt. It's Revolution is sacrifice. And I think that it belittles the role of the revolution to assume that anyone is really speaking from a position of privilege except for the people in power. Where do we get the idea? Where 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 does the the image come from of the leftist dude bro who has no skin in the game? Where does that come from? Well, we have everyone has skin in the game, but there is there there is a place where that image comes from, and it is it is it is the twenty five year old at Berkeley who's never worked a day in his life and who could live a comfortable life. The image there is of a person who doesn't really have a stake uh, here, but it's not really true. Um, that person does have stakes, as I as I just said. Why do we talk about the guy from Berkeley instead of the woman from South America? Okay, so the real reason is, yeah. is that the kid from Berkeley is not a majority group. I, he is he is a majority group in so much as he's a white guy, mm -hmm. but on the left, he's he's really not much of a majority because he is such a specific person. You have to narrow down the identity groups to get him, and he's a really pretty small demographic. Guys at Berkeley, 
um, who have a lot of money and who are white and who are privileged and who have never worked. Um, there, there really aren't millions of those people in the world. Mm -hmm. However, there are millions of people in South America. There are millions of workers in Detroit. There are millions of people who are affected by these leftist issues. And if you diminish those people and you make them sound like five guys in California, then you, you have diminished and belittled that movement. Um, you have delegitimized it. Because it's then not a group of millions. It's not a group representing worker interests all over the world. It's a few guys playing Xbox and complaining about capitalism in their spare time. So, in other words, mm -hmm. when you say that the leftists are all white, privileged douche bros who have no skin in the game, you are racistly ignoring the millions of other people who do absolutely deserve an equal share. Absolutely, absolutely. And right and 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 I think that in one of the videos that we recorded yesterday, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he's another prime, he's a prime example of this. Um, his um, Rainbow Coalition was um, work with you know the Black Panthers. And these are leftist organizations that are not white. And they get swept under the rug by these, these discussions. Whenever somebody says, oh, well, leftists are just these privileged white guys, um, it ignores the reality of all of these these people who are in much worse situations. Mm. Um, so framing it as a privileged position to take is a strategic attempt to remove the people who are not privileged from the discussion. Oh, okay. I feel like that sums it up pretty nicely. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. It's, it's, it's all about removing the people who aren't privileged. Mm -hmm. And I think that, if anything, saying that is a privileged position. Yeah.